Pakistan's cricketer turned politician Imran Khan has been recuperating in London after breaking his back in a dramatic fall from a high platform at a rally in Pakistan in the run up to the elections there in May. Despite the setback and having to continue the campaign from his hospital bed, Imran Khan's Movement for Justice Party gained nearly 8 million votes, coming in second behind Nawaz Sharif, who won the election. I went to meet him in London, where I began by asking him about his injuries and the impact on his political future. Miraculously, today he's walking normally. It turns out the bulletproof vest he was wearing when he fell more than 15 feet during a rally in Lahore almost three months ago saved him, not just from a bullet. I was uh, wearing a bulletproof vest because uh, the uh, agencies had told me that my life was threat under threat. So that actually saved me because I did a somersault fell on my back, and that, that acted as a cushion, the, the, the metal plating. So it protected my spine. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. I'm very lucky, actually, to be in the state I am. Now, while you've been sort of recuperating, uh, Malala has made her speech to the United Nations. The Taliban shot me on the left side of my forehead. They shot my friends, too. They thought that the bullet would silence us. But they failed. I wondered to what extent you really endorse her campaign for girls' education and how you would marry that with talking to the Taliban. Well, number one, I mean, uh, you know, everyone in Pakistan agrees with uh, her campaign. Everyone, Not her campaign. Everyone? I, I'm talking about, you know, 98% of the population would want women to be educated, but provided you respect their cultural norms... Including the Taliban? Taliban have splintered into about 25 or 30 groups now, with no centralized control. So because our, the, the, one of the four provinces where my party is in power, um, uh, three sides are surrounded by Fatah, where all the fighting Taliban and the Pakistan army is going on. So we now, it's not one, it's not one Taliban, there are about 25 uh, different groups and probably other groups too. Uh, so, Because we talked to a Taliban commander and he said, look, she should come back. She should come back, she would be safe, she, could, uh, she should be a good Pashtun Muslim and uh, she should continue her life in Pakistan. Would she be well advised to do that? Uh, f for one year, possibly not, because uh, you see, as long when the Americans leave Afghanistan, we could completely have a different situation in Pakistan too, because we could actually, the whole thing could start subsiding. Um, but it's tricky, I mean, what is the situation in Afghanistan after NATO leaves? We don't know as yet. This fanaticism which has gripped the country now, more radicalization than ever before. This will then, we hope, we'll be able to control uh, uh, the militancy. Who do you blame for the radicalization? Saudi Arabia? Well, I, first of all, I think it was like General Nick Carter, uh, the British commander in Afghanistan. I read a statement where he said that 10 years ago they should have talked to the Taliban. I think initially if, if Al-Qaeda and Taliban were separated, because Taliban, Pashtuns, they had no capability of attacking Western targets. It was Al-Qaeda. So that effort wasn't made. And, and then when the Taliban were toppled, they were weak, that was the time to hold political uh, uh, talks with them and, and sort of separate them from Al-Qaeda. Uh, and, and he quite rightly says, and I believe that's what should have been done, that that opportunity was lost. And now that the Taliban know that NATO is leaving next year, I mean, they are talking from a position of strength. How do you talk to them then? Who do you talk to? In Pakistan, we don't know, you know, who these groups are now, because it started off with a TTP about uh, five, five years back, and now in every tribal agency, seven of them, there, there is now a, a, a Taliban group, and they've splintered further. Uh, and a lot of criminals, young people, unemployed, they've become Taliban. You know, you, you don't need any qualification to become Taliban. You can just uh, one day uh, make a group and call yourself Taliban. So we really need, I mean, Pakistan's number one issue now is to deal with uh, uh, terrorism. But terrorism is generated by several different forces. W one, of course, is the continuing spillover of the war into Pakistan, the drone attacks. W what would you do about the drone attacks? 
You see, what the drones do is that they link Pakistan with the U.S. war. Once Pakistan is considered a collaborator of the U.S., then the Taliban's narrative of jihad against the Pakistan army and security forces and the police, then the, they can call for jihad. Jihad means suicide attacks, suicide, su suicide attacks, because it's martyrdom. So to take the motivation away from the, from the suicide attacker, it's imperative that Pakistan disengages from the U.S. war. In the latest figures I've seen, which admittedly only go up to uh, 2009 or so, talk about 94 children being killed in drone attacks. But drone attacks, it's the most inhuman thing uh, any, uh, any civilized country could think of. Well, are you surprised that there isn't more protest in the West against them? Uh, because in the West, people don't understand anything about drone attacks. They are given wrong figures. Uh, the Peshawar High Court asked the political agent in Waziristan to give the figures of civilians killed in drone attacks. This is about uh, two months back, two and a half months back. The political agent first refused, means that our government was collaborating with the U.S. and hiding the facts about uh, drone victims. And then when the judge forced him, he, he next day he came and gave the figures that in the last five years, 1,500 civilians had died in which there were women and children. Only 47 militants were killed. And 330 were maimed, in other words, minus limbs when the bomb explodes. So these figures were hidden from the Pakistani uh, public, by our own government. Uh, and it's certainly hidden from the Western public about what's, what the drones do. How can they say a bomb exploding in a village will only kill militants? What's your ambition now? Because the, the breakthrough, you've done better than you've ever done before, but nevertheless, you're never going to be prime minister, are you? Uh, well, I mean, bearing in mind that we were, uh, we broken through a two-party system. We're the second biggest party in Pakistan. I mean, it very rarely happens that you break through in a two-party system. First time, uh, you know, a party went out of its way to give tickets to young people. 35% were below the age of 40. It's never happened before. And in 123 seats, came second. So, uh, and at 140, you form government. So. I think so the we have, breakthrough is around the corner. So I think we are sitting uh, in a very good position right now. How much of a setback has your accident had? It was a huge setback because, you know, the, the, the campaign was going to, towards its peak. I mean, we had never had uh, we seen such scenes in Pakistan, young voters coming out for the first time, youth getting politicized. Women, never have you seen them in such numbers coming out to vote. So it was reaching its peak, and the last two days were going to be the peak of the campaign, and so it was unfortunate. Imran Khan, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Pleasure.